Good evening. Thank you very much uh, for your presence. Um, let me let me start with this uh, last session of the day. It's been a, a very long day, and uh, I'm sure that everybody is uh, is already very exhausted and, and looking forward to the dinner. So we we hope we will be able to offer you a discussion on a very important topic. We have a, a very distinguished panel here uh, that will uh, help us on this. Let me just start by saying that um, um, I'm, my name is Alberto Leighton. I'm a lead public sector specialist at the World Bank. And I want to say that um, on behalf of the World Bank, we are, we are um, very, very thankful that, uh, to the organizers for giving us this opportunity to co-sponsor and to organize uh, um, this, uh, this session. This session is about justice. Justice that is a, a very important topic, very well connected to economic uh, development. We have titled this, this uh, session as Justice in the 21st Century, uh, Transitioning Towards an, a Smarter, Faster and More Transparent Justice System to Support the Economic Recovery and Resilience. This has to do uh, with uh, efforts that the government in Greece is, is trying to to do uh, in the context of this uh, post-crisis effort to recover, and the focus on the, on the justice sector is critical for this. At the World Bank, we have been uh, analyzing this, uh, this issue uh, for many years in many other countries. We believe that a very uh, a reliable, transparent, and uh, efficient judicial system is critical for an effective rule of law and proper institutions for development. This is something that is uh, very relevant to the, to the reality in Greece. Greece has been making a lot of improvements lately, but there are still many challenges, particularly on one aspect that has to do with establishing a more agile, more rapid uh, judicial system to deliver uh, judicial services and in that way establish that uh, the, the, the desired rule of law. And this is, a, this is very important, but it also comes with a very important challenges. Uh, it, it will not happen over time, uh, overnight. Uh, we have to manage the expectations about the process that it takes. And in the World Bank, uh, we, we always try to refer to, uh, or use this phrase from Gordon Brown that he says, in establishing a rule of law, the first, the first five centuries are the hardest. This just to illustrate you know, how important and challenging this agenda is. So with that, let me, um, let me stop here and introduce our, our panel. Um, we have the honor of having as the keynote speaker for this panel, uh, Deputy Prime, Prime Minister Pianois uh, Picamenos. Um, he needs no presentation, of course, here. Uh, he's Deputy Prime Minister, uh, lawyer by profession, extensive political career in the country, but also an extensive uh, career also in the, in the justice sector. Um, he will be delivering a, a keynote for this session that will set the stage uh, for our discussion. We, always, uh, we also have uh, Simos Anastosopoulos. He's president of the Council of uh, Competitiveness in Greece, Compete Greece. Uh, he's chairman and CEO of uh, Petit Savis SA. He is member of the board of the Pan Pan Hellenic Association of Pharmaceutical Industries and member of the General Council uh, of uh, SAB Hellenic uh, Federation Enterprises and also president emeritus of the American Hellenic Chamber of Commerce. So he will be presenting us the perspective in Greece from the private sector, which is critical to this agenda. Also as part of our panel, we have uh, our guest, Georg Stawa. He's lawyer by profession as well, he's Austrian. Um, he's currently the judicial counsel for uh, South, Southeast Europe in, in the Austrian government. Um, and beyond the, the, his experience in the, uh, in the justice sector and participating in many efforts in, in other countries, Mr. Stawa has been a member of the European Commission for the Efficiency of Justice, CEPESH, uh, for m more than 15 years, um, and, and he, he has served as the president of CEPESH uh, in 2014. So he will be presenting us with the perspective of the European Union and, and that regional view of the challenges that uh, state members in, in Europe 
are, are, are facing in this, uh, in this uh, sector. And finally, we have our colleague from the World Bank, David Bernstein. He's also lead public sector specialist in, in the bank, working uh, in the managing region in, in North Africa and, and the Middle East. He's also a lawyer by, by profession. He also has uh, uh, studies in economics and political science. He had been, um, after doing some private legal practice in, in the United States, uh, he, he joined the bank and he has been leading uh, public se sector reform projects focusing on the justice sector and on anti-corruption programs since 2010. So uh, he will be providing us more with the global perspective from the experience that the World Bank could share with, uh, uh, from other countries to Greece. So with that introduction, let me pass uh, to the Deputy Prime Minister for the keynote. So please, Mr. Thank you. Patronomonos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear members of the panel, of the panel uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very happy that uh, this year's Delphi Forum takes place with uh, physical attendance, and uh, after so many years, two or three years, we are in a position to, to see each other, to discuss with each other, to be close with each other, and that's a very good thing, I believe. <clears throat> so now to our uh, agenda. It's quite obvious that independent and effective justice system is the foundation on which modern constitutional state is built. Justice is one of the crucial factors in maintaining social cohesion, institutional stability, and last but not least, economic growth. Today, I would like to focus mainly on the relation between the administration of justice and the economy. Economic theory suggests that even the best designed regulatory environment may not be efficient if not combined with an effective judicial system. Many studies show that even a month of delay in the adjudication of cases can slow down overall economic growth in a significant way. According to the World Bank, in 2018, Greece had an average of four years delay between the filing of a petition and the final decision. It was therefore clear that measures had to be taken to improve the speed of justice. However, the choice of these measures and the method of their implementation had to be made very carefully. Any reforms had to be part of a carefully designed, unified and coherent framework taking into account not only the particular goals to be achieved, but also the interactions between the measures taken and their consequences for the judiciary especially. In any case, it is of the utmost importance that any reform should come as a product of deliberation and, if possible, consent consent among all stakeholders, and particularly among the judiciary. The only way to lead and achieve a significant reform is for everyone involved to accept changes, to recognize them as a non-negotiable demand, and stand behind them. Only then can we hope for a true and effective justice reform. Otherwise, any change is doomed to fail, as has happened so many times in the past, as you know. 
from the beginning of its term, the present government has shown its willingness to undertake in cooperation with the judiciary essential reforms in order to enhance the speed and overall efficiency of justice. Many of these reforms were incorporated in the framework of the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. The Greek government has already undertaken a series of projects and reforms with a total budget of over 250 million euros. And all these reforms aim at the following objectives. First, strengthening the prestige and credibility of justice. Second, accelerating the administration of justice. And third, improving the quality of rulings, the quality. So let me mention a few of these reforms, starting with the new legal framework for the National School of Judges, which, which I believe sets the foundation for any real future changes. And I am very proud to say that my team and uh, myself have played a dominant role in preparing uh, this law. The most important element in any justice system are the judges themselves. The legal education and training, but also their mindset, their culture, and the perception of their role. The proper selection, education, and lifelong training of judges ensures their commitment to their constitutional role strengthens their independence and increases the quality in the administration of justice. In this context, the new legal framework revisits and improves many important factors of selection and training. It is the selection criteria for future judges, the curriculum of the National School of Judges, with a view to more practical as well as modern elements of training, a more meaningful and effective internship stage in the various courts, obligatory lifelong training of judges, and finally, training and evaluation of teachers and trainers. In line with the firm belief that all good justice reform begins with the members of the judiciary, the next step that the government will take is the reform of the code of courts and judges, the fair and effective evaluation of judges, their promotion to the higher rank on merit, and not just on seniority as it happens today, and the proper disciplinary measures in case of inadequacy are quite a few reforms that we will be done in the code. Next step, we should not forget that the, that the administrative and operational support of the judiciary which is provided by the body of judicial clerks and can be also be crucial to the speed and quality of justice. In this context, another important initiative is the establishment of a new school of judicial clerks. The new school will be responsible for the selection and training in order to ensure that the selected personnel can meet the high expectation of their position in the most effective manner. So now, moving on from the human element, another critical element in justice reform is what we call the judicial map.
It is of great importance for the effective administration of justice to redistribute the courts at a geographical level by application of rational and objective criteria, <coughs> such as the size of each court, the volume of new and pending cases per court, the population density in judicial districts, the infrastructure of the buildings, etc. This is not easy to be done. This is not at all easy to be done, but I think step by step we will succeed to do it. Now we go to the wide implementation of the justice systems. As you know, the contribution of digital technologies to the efficiency of the justice system and the administration of justice is undeniable. Digitization increases the efficiency of judges and judicial clerks, reduces the margin for human error, helps lawyers monitor cases more efficiently, and enhances overall transparency and account accountability. Finally, I would like to stress the importance of establishing and strengthening out-of-court disputes. Alternative dispute resolution is characterized by speed, low cost, flexibility, and efficiency. It also contributes in reducing court disputes, freeing valuable resources for the justice systems. Our goal, ladies and gentlemen, is to transform justice in Greece so that it is no longer considered an investment risk, but a competitive advantage for our country, leading to positive results for the national economy and most of all for the Greek people. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prekalemos. Uh, I think um, the, your presentation was very, very helpful, very comprehensive okay. in terms of presenting the challenges as well as the, this uh, very ambitious program that the government has and that I think is very, very much in line with uh, what we see most of the um, advanced countries are doing and, are try and trying to accomplish. Let's, uh, let's pass now to our, our um, panelists to, to comment on this, uh, on this interesting presentation. And maybe we can start um, with Timos here uh, to pro and ask him to provide us the local perspective from the economic perspective, the private sector perspective, and maybe highlighting that, uh, that last phrase that the Deputy Prime Minister mentioned, uh, in or, uh, this, this uh, idea of uh, transforming what is considered an investment risk into a competitive advantage. That's a very interesting way to put it. So please, Simon. It's not an easy task. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no. Thank you, Alberto. I'm very happy to be back uh, to Delphi in person uh, this time, and I would like to thank uh, World Bank for the invitation to participate in uh, this panel. No. Although the justice system in Greece does not differ from uh, any other corresponding system in uh, the EU, in practice it suffers from chronic deficiencies widely recognized by both domestic and international actors and international observers, including the European Commission, by the way, and the World Bank, have underlined the need to increase efficiency and improve the quality of the justice system. It is not only that the average time needed to enforce a contract in Greece is uh, four and a half years, maybe five, which ranks Greece below most of the developed and developing countries of the world and among EU's worst performers with regard to the time needed uh, to resolve civil, commercial, administrative, and other cases. More important is uh, the image that uh, is projected from our courts. 
and that is of a third world country. Daily schedules are not kept. Lawyers and concerned parties uh, have to appear in court. They are obliged to appear in court in time, of course, without knowing when or if their case is uh, ever going to be tried the same day. The government, as is apparent from the Deputy Prime Minister's uh, speech, recognizes the problems quite well. A long backlog of uh, cases, uh, little if any autonomy of the courts, government uh, selection, appointment and control of higher ranking uh, members of the judiciary, outdated infrastructure and methods of work, lack of modern management uh, skills and computer skills among the administrative uh, employees, the clerks of the courts and some older judges. Having established all this, which is the base to start our discussion, I believe, uh, please allow me to offer some insight and uh, assist the discussion based on uh, the important uh, uh, referral that the Deputy Prime Minister did about uh, the reforms that the government intends to bring to justice, that we really transform justice. Based on uh, the insights uh, that, uh, and my experience as an entrepreneur, as well as uh, from my long involvement in uh, the several business bodies I have participated over time. Uh, Mr. Pekameno said uh, the most important thing, that it is of the utmost importance that any reform should come as a product of deliberation and possibly consent among interested uh, parties. Uh, we couldn't agree more. However, consent uh, is not very popular in Greece these days. It hasn't been in the past, especially lately it hasn't been at all. But a government with, uh, as the one that uh, is running the country right now, with strong will and abundant political capital should proceed with reforms that are deemed necessary at any cost today, especially regarding the judicial system that everyone recognizes as ineffective today. Regarding the legal education and training, but uh, the mindset, as you mentioned, and uh, the obligatory lifelong training of judges. Of course, it's absolutely correct, and we should do it. It is one of the most important reforms needed today. Uh, I would like to mention, though, that uh, as new concepts appear before the courts for fighting derivatives, cryptocurrencies, just to mention a few, judges should be educated and trained continuously. So we do not see again cases like the one we had in the past about leasing, uh, when judges, not understanding the concept, convicted all bank CEOs at the time for false uh, documentation, and the matter had to be resolved by law that exonerated all of them at the time. The reform of the code of courts and judges, and the evaluation of judges, their promotion to the higher rank on merit, and uh, disciplinary measures in case of inadequacy. Another very important uh, reform. Of course, they are overcoming the resistance of judges and prosecutors is of utmost importance. I would like to add, though, that today, Judicial decisions are not reviewed for their quality. A system that records, for example, how many first court uh, decisions are overruled by the second degree could provide the basis for the evaluation of the quality of the system and the judges. It will also serve to reduce the amount of time that any citizen or investor needs to resolve a dispute. Regarding the judicial uh, clerks, uh, you know, the delays or in some cases the speed at which the administration introduces to the system several cases is notorious, not only for its competence level, uh, but uh, for other reasons only. Digitalization will help greatly in the effectiveness and transparency uh, of the system. And regarding the last issue that uh, the Deputy Prime Minister mentioned, we strongly believe in the value of uh, out-of-court dispute resolution institutions and uh, arbitration, of course. And I would like to see more support on alternative dispute resolution systems. The Vice President himself has supported such a mechanism, and uh, I can tell you that uh, with my other capacity as President of the Association of SAs, we also offer, through the Association, such services of high quality and efficiency. And Alberto would like to stop here so that uh, we continue the discussion and perhaps offer some areas of consideration in the next round. Very good, Simos. That, that's, very, that's very helpful and I think it is very relevant. Of course, this is, of course, this is a perspective of, uh, of one sector that is 
critical to the economy and, and is a, a direct user of these services. So all this list of challenges that uh, Simon has shared with, with, with us, I think, are very relevant when it comes to develop all these ideas and implementing the, the reform agenda that was presented. So why don't we now move uh, a little bit, you know, beyond uh, the, the context of Greece and see how this is being dealt with in, in, uh, in the regional and the global level. So let me pass it to Gord first, first that, uh, to, for him to share with us the European perspective on these issues, because this is relevant not just for Greece, but for most member states, right? Thank you very much, Alberto, and uh, thanks for uh, the invite and setting up this kind of topic, because it is not very popular usually to uh, speak about justice and uh, see this kind of connection between uh, judicial services and uh, the economy. And I can assure the uh, um, Deputy Prime Minister that not everything is bad uh, in Greece, uh, even if <laughs> there will be, there will be uh, a lot of good things uh, you mentioned in comparison also to other European countries. Because the challenges which were mentioned are not only the challenges uh, towards the, the Greek system, but is de facto challenging all the countries uh, and the judicial systems in Europe, which deal with the efficiency question, the speed and the quality. Uh, while the speed is the most significant story, which is uh, quite logic as everything on our economic uh, behavior and uh, activities sped up quite dramatically over the last 10, 20 years. We used to solve everything in 24 hours with uh, a few short messages. But then we go to the court and ask the court also, please, uh, uh, honorable judge, I have a problem here, can you solve it by tomorrow? Uh, no, yeah, because uh, the definition how we solve problems in front of a court by the procedural code and by applying the law usually does not work by the method we apply. I not say it's not possible within 24 hours, but it is not the system we apply. Still, in, in de facto in full Europe, we behave like we would be in the 19th century. If you look closer, you see that all the procedural codes, even if digitalized or not, coming from late 19th century, and some genius law professors uh, uh, put something on paper which was valid in a time where people in the morning stood up, saddled the horse, rode to the court with the claim in the hand. In front of the judge they met, the judge was doing the trials, found the decision hopefully. Both were riding home in the evening, one more happy than the other. And that was it. Yes, but this is the procedural code. And many of our systems in Europe, even with the so-called digitalization, did not more than just exchanging the horse by a scanned PDF. Yeah, but the rest is the same. And this is not working in 2022 anymore. Uh, saying this, that on the speed story, I really uh, encourage everyone, not only the, the, the Greek colleagues, but maybe the World Bank as some kind of uh, always catalytic institution, to ask for these genius lawmakers from the 19th century, if they would be beamed into today's uh, uh, panel here, they would likely litter their procedural codes, grab out their mobile phones and say, okay, what can we do on the green table with the mo modern devices we have on the technology? Meaning, is it possible to have digital res uh, dispute resolution in a way like everyone who is even on the lawyer has access to? And this also, I was glad that you mentioned and you, you, you go into this deep, um, uh, painful exercise of uh, redefining the court map, because also mainly misunderstood in those countries who do, we, which do we it. Will it. We will try here. To you should, you should, <laughs> because it is improves, improving the quality. I will touch the quality later on then. Uh, Everybody still misunderstands that uh, the, the redesigning the court map means, ah, oh, I'm against because the court is not accessible anymore. Like, like access to justice would be knocking on the wooden door of the courthouse. No, it's not. Yeah? It's the amount of information you can get on your digital means in your pocket if you have a problem to have uh, a first access, maybe even uh, solving a problem by the information you get about the costs, about the length of procedure, and then if you go to court, you want to have a specialist, uh, which is touching the quality issue uh, beyond the speed. So, uh, one, last, uh, one last short story before I hand over uh, to see in which, which dimension we move. We try to speed up the, the procedure, and, and I would encourage to def redefine it newly, not missing the quality. But what does it mean, missing the quality, if we 
do not succeed to improve the system, our cases, including the clients, are diversifying anywhere else. Just one figure to imagine. The digital dispute resolution system of eBay, which is de facto something like a district court would do on low level, solves six, more than 60 million cases a year. 60 million litigious cases a year is about 10 times the German judiciary. That means if you would put the eBay judiciary, let's call it like this, on a European map, it would be the biggest judiciary in Europe. I, as a Western European, I trust the eBay company that they apply some kind of fair mechanism in when I uh, do this as a customer. But I don't know if they apply solutions according to the European Charter of Human Rights. And if there's something wrong, I cannot go to Strasbourg with it uh, in, in the meanwhile. Yeah? But it means we need this kind of new transformation. And yes, it's painful, it's a lot of reform, but uh, uh, let's do it. In, 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 and let's, let's encourage ourselves to look for new paths on that. It would totally pay off in safeguarding uh, the interests of economy and uh, the parties. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorge. That was very, very interesting uh, um, comments in terms of the challenges, but also the opportunities. Uh, interesting comparison, you know, with uh, how technology could be leveraged in order to do this. It's not just about, you know, bringing the, the existing system into the computer. It's really about reimagining uh, what could be done uh, given all these opportunities. No? So we will get back to that when, when we uh, refer to recommendations. But David, why don't you give us now the perspective that what's happening in the rest of the world? What are the, the big trends now that we see on how judicial systems are being reformed? Well, um, thanks, Alberto. Uh, there were a number of points that came out of the Deputy Prime Minister's talk that really struck a chord with me. Um, because they brought back memories of many of the reform projects that I've worked on in the past um, through the bank, uh, through the World Bank. Um, the first one that struck me was the focus on, and your emphasis on quality, in addition to the speed and efficiency. Um, oftentimes, I think as Jörg mentioned, you know, we focus on the numbers and how many years it is or how many days it takes, um, because that's easier to measure. It's much more difficult to measure the quality of a decision. Um, it's much more difficult to improve the quality of a decision. Um, but I think it's very important that that be a goal, that that be part of a reform process, so that we're not just focused, the government and the judiciary aren't just focused on speed um, when, um, when the quality matters. Um, to the credibility of the system um, and to the trust in the, in the judicial system, um, one of the things we found is, um, is that the more you can build that credibility and trust, the more people will be accepting of whatever the process is. Um, so I think that that was the, the first thing that really struck me in the, in the Greek reforms that, that you described. Uh, the second was one that I, I kind of had a laugh a little bit about was the, the role of the judges. I mean, we talk about the justice system and the judiciary, and I've been in many meetings with ministries of justice, um, and we often, as the World Bank, we often play a go-between kind of the middleman role between the Ministry of Justice and the judiciary. Um, it, is, it was very heartening to hear you talk about the consultations and the fact that you know, the, the judiciary is both an object of the reform, but they also have to lead the reform. I mean, one of the key lessons I've taken from a number of the countries that, that the World Bank has worked in is that if you want to have a sustainable reform, then the judges need to be part of it. Uh, there's one country in um, Central and Eastern Europe where I can remember where the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and the Minister of Justice would constantly have battles in the public, in the press, about the reform efforts. And it was when the bank team came to the country that we actually sat down and I could get the two of them to kind of start to agree on what the reforms were. And I think that, you know, learning from those lessons, the, I think a, a key challenge always is in this reform process is making sure that the judiciary is both is part of the reform process, that they're part of the implementation, the design of it, and then part of the implementation. Um, and I think that the more that can be done in each step, in each of the areas that you described, even when you're talking about judicial clerks, the judges need to be involved because they're the, the clerks of the support system. The, yeah, they're the yes. support system for the, for the judges. So I think that's a real key, uh, a key focus uh, and a key challenge that all countries have faced when they've done the reforms. 
Um, the last point I had was that, that came up was the, the discussion of, of e-justice. And this has oftentimes been, um, this is something actually inside the bank where we talk about e-government and e-governance. Um, and a lot of focus is on, and Jörg made the, the great point, a lot of focus is on digitizing what exists. When, what, when, when the problem is what exists, <laughs> right? The problem is the procedures, the processes. Um, and so focusing on those procedures and policies as the first step. Um, so there are many times when we'll sit down and, and ministers and, and the, the judiciary wants to know about how many computers can we purchase you know, with, if we work with the World Bank? What type of software you know, can we get for the case management system? And I usually have to deliver the disappointing news that I'm not going to talk about any of that until we talk about your civil procedure code <laughs> and your criminal procedure code and exactly, and we want to map all and that again out. again and again. Yeah, and yeah. I want to talk to some, some lawyers who actually have to go through all those processes. Then we'll talk to you about what the system should look like. Um, so in, in it's very key, um, as and I think you mentioned in, in your remarks, that when you talk about digitization, you know, we, always, we often talk again about m moving faster, being more efficient. But it's the transparency that matters it, as far as the, for the public. It's being able to see the process, being able to see the decisions, you know, being able to track the decisions. I think you said, you know, for the, even for the lawyers to be able to track the process so that you don't go to court and, and not know whether your case is going to be heard or not and, uh, uh, and as, as we heard is part of the problem. So to me, those are the key challenges that I think the, that the, at least the reforms that you brought up um, emphasized. And, and I think that, that those are the same ones that we have seen over years in, in just about all of the countries where we've done, um, worked with judicial reforms. Thank you. Thank you, David. I think that's um, also reassuring in terms of the, of the scope of the challenges and the agenda that we have in front uh, that uh, needs to be tackled in, in, in very comprehensively, as I think uh, the Greek government is doing through this uh, um, reform program that we have seen. So based on these uh, initial uh, reactions, comments, and, uh, and uh, the way that challenges are being presented from the local perspective, the regional perspective, the global perspective, Mr. Bikramenos, can you share us with us your reactions? How do you see this? Uh, are you aware of all these uh, uh, reflections? And um, how do you see uh, the, the challenges uh, moving forward? And we will then ask our panelists to also offer more concrete recommendations you know, in terms of what, from this external perspective to the government, could be done you know, so that we can also contribute to that debate. So, I could see many co common problems that we have, and uh, <clears throat> I cannot see many solutions to be offered, <laughs> prima vista, and uh, if I can express myself in Greek, it would be easier. There is a translation. <clears throat> Please. So I continue in Greek. Uh, Ο κύριος δίπλα μου, ε, το όνομά του, ε, έκανε μνήα <coughs> ότι βασιζόμαστε ακόμα στα νομικά συστήματα του 19ου αιώνα, as you said. Αυτό είναι αλήθεια. Αλλά εγώ δεν βλέπω στον νομικό κόσμο να έχει προταθεί κάποιο νέο σύστημα επίλυσης διαφορών. Και αυτό είναι το μεγάλο πρόβλημα, ότι ενώ η τεχνολογία και οι άλλες επιστήμες κάνουν άλματα και προοδεύουν με αλματώδη πραγματικά τρόπο, η νομική επιστήμη δεν έχει καταφέρει να κάνει τέτοιου είδους πρόοδους και πολύ φοβούμε ότι δεν είναι δεν θα μπορέσει να καταφέρει να κάνει τέτοιου είδους. Δηλαδή, ο ανθρώπινος νους δεν πιστεύω ότι θα μπορέσει κάποτε να συλλάβει 
κάποιο άλλ, κάποιον άλλον τρόπο επίλυσης διαφορών από αυτόν τον οποίο έχουμε ήδη από την αρχαιότητα. Από την αρχαιότητα πραγματικά, <coughs> γρόσο μόντο, ακολουθούμε το ίδιο σύστημα επίλυσης διαφορών. Βεβαίως έχουν αλλάξει οι κώδικες, έχουν αλλάξει περιφορέ, έχουν αλλάξει τα ένδικα μέσα, έχει μπει το e μέσα, το οποίο όμως πιο πολύ μας προμηθεύει με στοιχεία, με αντικειμενικά στοιχεία, με διαφάνεια όπως παρατηρήσατε και είναι, αυτό είναι πάρα πολύ αποτελεσματικό για να κάνουμε αυτό που είπαμε το judicial map, το δικαστικό χάρτη διότι μόνο αν έχουμε αντικειμενικά στοιχεία για το κάθε δικαστήριο στην ελληνική επικράτεια θα μπορέσουμε πιο εύκολα και χωρίς να έχουμε μίζωνες αντιδράσεις από τους τοπικούς παράγοντες να προχωρήσουμε σε μία αναμόρφωση του δικαστικού χάρτη. Διότι τα αντικειμενικά στοιχεία δεν μπορεί να τα αντικρούσει κάποιος. Εάν ένα δικαστήριο βγάζει τρεις αποφάσεις το χρόνο ή βγάζει 50 αποφάσεις το χρόνο από τις οποίες οι 40 είναι προσωρινά μέτρα, αυτό είναι αντικειμενικό στοιχείο. Και πάλι βέβαια θα έχουμε πιέσεις από τους τοπικούς παράγοντες, αλλά είναι πιο εύκολο να τους αποκρούσουμε αυτές τις πιέσεις όταν έχουμε αντικειμενικά στοιχεία μπροστά μας. Ωστόσο επανερχόμενος θα έλεγα ότι η νομική επιστήμη και γενικά η επίλυση της διαφοράς είναι κάτι το οποίο δεν έχει βρεθεί ακόμη ο τρόπος και πιστεύω ότι ούτε θα μπορέσει εύκολα να βρεθεί. Να επιληθεί, να αλλάξει και να επιταχυνθεί με, με πολύ αποφασιστικό τρόπο η επίλυση των διαφορών. Και αυτό, χωρίς πάλι όπως παρατηρήσατε, το θέμα της ποιότητας είναι ένα άλλο θέμα, διότι εστιάζουμε κυρίως στην ποσότητα και στην ταχύτητα και δεν εστιάζουμε τόσο πολύ στην ποιότητα της αποφάσεως. Ε, για να μην μακρήγορο, θα ήθελα να πω <coughs> ότι όλα αυτά τα θέματα και ό, όλες τις παρατηρήσεις οι οποίες έγιναν προηγουμένως, τα έχουμε υπόψη μας. Και κοιτάμε να βελτιώσουμε μο, όχι μόνο την διαβίου επιμόρφωση των δικαστών, πράγμα το οποίο έγινε με το νέο νόμο της Σχολής Δικαστών. Ε, κοιτάμε να βελτιώσουμε και τη σχέση μεταξύ του επιθεωρούμενου και του επιθεωρητή και τα κριτήρια πώς θα γίνεται η επιθεώρηση, ήδη και αυτά από κριτήρια επιλογής που ήταν, πήγαινε ο επιθεωρητής και έλεγε «Δώσε μου όποιες αποφάσεις θες». Τώρα δεν είναι καθόλου έτσι. Λέμε συγκεκριμένα πράγματα τι πρέπει να πάρουν και μου έχει περάσει από το μυαλό να επιθεωρείται και ο επιθεωρών. Δηλαδή, να... Το θέμα είναι ανάληψη ευθυνών. Πρέπει να υπάρχει ευθύνη. Και τελευταίο το οποίο θέλω να πω, όλα αυτά πρέπει να ο δικαστής να τα αισθανθεί μέσα του, να τα κάνει μέρος του εαυτού του. Γιατί αν ο δικαστής αυτά τα πράγματα δεν τα ενστερνίζει το ίδιος, δεν κάνουμε τίποτα στην ουσία. Μπλέκουμε με το δικαστικό συνδικαλισμό και δεν βρίσκουμε άκρη. Άρα είναι πάρα πολύ κύριο να αλλάξουμε την νοοτροπία που υπάρχει αυτή τη στιγμή. Συγγνώμη αν μακρηγόρησα. No, thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that comment. I think uh, you very well captured, you know, the... the those challenges you know, that are, are very present are real for Greece 
as a real for most of the countries. For the whole no? world. The whole world is trying to, to disentangle this, uh, uh, this uh, problem. Um, what, something that you have mentioned, I think, is, is, is very important to take into account that what we are discussing here is very, probably not much the principles of justice. I think those uh, we know very well you know, what, what, we need, what we want to accomplish. It's more about the how to get there, you know, how, how we establish a system that is responsive, that is timely, that is effective and, uh, and that is fair. And how do we use the resources that are always scarce but are, always, uh, but are also innovative? You know, that could help us accelerate this process. So with that in mind, um, let's ask our, our panelists now uh, to, to come up with some, some recommendations, may, maybe more from the practical perspective, you know, on uh, you know, what what's experience uh, is telling us where to start, what are the priorities within the priorities, because this is already prioritized, but uh, even that we, we need to narrow down. Uh, and based on that, contribute, as I was saying, to this debate. So let me reverse the order now and maybe ask David first to, to come in from the global perspective. What do you see? Sure. Um, one of the things just over my career working on a variety of different reforms, not just um, justice reform, I, I think that um, what I've learned in preparing for this panel and, and um, from the talk today is the importance of the process of reform. So as much as we often, we focus on technical solutions and the specifics of either legislative solutions, procedural solutions, the actual process of going through reform, I mean, in the bank we, are, we have a lot of focus on kind of change management and how you manage the, the, the change. I think that that is it, it, as important as the technical substantive part of the reform. And particularly for the point that you made um, at the end, um, so kind of my, so my first recommendation is really to focus on that, keep that consultative open process that you've described and that you've established. Um, because I think that actually helps with my, my second recommendation, which is the point you made, again, the, that the Deputy Prime Minister made at the end, which is that it's really the norms and the judicial behavior. So we can change a whole lot of the infrastructure and the physical things or the tools that they have, um, but it's that longer term change um, and I, 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 you know, as you were talking about the, the slow change in, in legal scholarship and judicial scholarship, um, you know, a, a, as a lawyer, I often would say, look, you know, we're trained not to change. We're trained to interpret what existed before and how, it, and how to apply that now. So change doesn't come naturally to, I think, the four of us on the panel here, or the five of us as, as, as lawyers. Um, and that's really the hard part of, of all of these reforms. So your focus on judicial training and the lifelong training is really key. Um, it's kind of a, you know, it's one of those things that doesn't pay off quickly, um, but in the long run, that'll have a, a and, big impact. And a different example, a different judge that can change mind yeah, to, to, to have a different... Uh, ab absolutely, absolutely. And that, that exposure, the exposure back exposure. and forth, um, I think, you know, I think the CEPEJ would do that, um, has done that in the past, and many of our projects do the, do the same thing. Um, the last point is just a, a, a kind of a, a favorite point of mine. Um, you mentioned very briefly about the infrastructure and the, um, and, and the, the rebuilding of courts or the renovation of courts. Um, you know, as a lawyer, I knew nothing about architecture. I mean, I didn't study it. I have no, know nothing about it. But I worked very closely with, uh, with architects, and I was amazed to learn how, maybe this is obvious to others, but the physical structure has such an impact on the people who go there. Um, so I had a, we had in one country where we had, um, there was a lot of, of disabled citizens because of earthquakes. And one of the key things in rebuilding the courts in those areas was to make them access, to have ramps, to have elevators. Yeah. Um, and some of the, you know, and being, having the citizens, having the government show to the citizens that we recognize what your, what your dis disability is, but it doesn't stop you from accessing judicial services. It shouldn't stop you from being able to get to visit the courts or, or to get your documents stamped. 
Um, so I think, you know, as much as we look at the court as kind of a, a, a structure of integrity, um, the actual access issues that, that when you rebuild and when you reconstruct, I think are really critical to how citizens view the whole reform process. And the judges. Uh, yeah. It's good for the judges. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, David. Kirk. I may take, uh, as, a, as a former judge, I'm allowed to, to, to take one point you mentioned, uh, that uh, the judges are conservative. Yes, they are, because this is why we select them. I mean, we select them to be conservative. This is not a creative job. You should not invent new rules and colorful things every day. No, you should apply something which is according to what the Supreme Court decided and what is then transparently also predictable to someone who comes to the court. So don't be surprised that the judges are not the front runners on any kind of reform because we selected them to be conservative in applying rules. Um, but I agree, of course, you have to develop and you have to train they, yourself and you have to adopt uh, to whatever is changing creative. in the surrounding. And th yes. that's, that's the logic. Uh, but what also uh, concludes from this is if you do reforms or even if you do normal legal development, and I've never seen this in, in the ministry, in, in, uh, in, it live or not in, in my ministry in Austria, you, do a, you design a law, a new law, yeah? And there is these legal professionals they, who are per perfectly specialized doing this since ever they did. They draft some kind of genius piece of paper and then when it is finished, even sometimes when it is through the parliamentary process, they take the full bunch of papers and hand it over to the IT companies and say, now make it digital. And then the first time a software engineer sees what, what, what the hell? I cannot picture this exemptions from exemptions from exemptions under a special condition, this is not 0101. But why no one is designing laws with having the software engineer sitting next to him or her? Yeah? And uh, they should have a dialogue in modern times. Whatever you design in law in 2020 must be applicable to some kind of uh, digital story. Either the machine can decide about or you can at least presented in the logic where with a drop-down menu, if you, the non-lawyer, go through, are able to understand. Because then we are at what also I think uh, uh, David mentioned is also lacking in all the countries. Trans uh, a, a transparent way to explain the parties who are usually non-lawyers what will happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I was uh, administering justice at the courts, I can assure you that 80% of the people had no clue what will happen here even if they come with a private lawyer, even if they are prepared, but de facto they had no idea what will happen then afterwards. Yeah, they are totally in, in God's hands and then uh, have no idea about how long it takes, how much it costs, etc. It is easy to solve. If you would have a permission in the law that the judge is obliged to tell what the next hour will cost and what the full procedure will cost, and how long it takes would solve likely 30% of all the, the disputes because people would then start to think economically and say, okay, if I spend 10,000 euros for a claim which is 20,000 euros, maybe not that wise to go on lengthy. Yeah? So we may find some mediation story. And there are countries who do that, uh, at least in, in Europe I saw countries who also put on the corridors of the courthouse and on the internet how long it ta will take on average to solve the, the, the dispute. And if you read this and say, okay, my, the average, on average it takes nine months, if you're lucky six, also makes things a little bit more vivid and costs nothing. And so I, I'm a little bit also uh, a fan of let's focus on easy solutions which cost nothing and have a huge effect and in increasing efficiency without losing the quality at all. Thank you, Gar. So opening the black box so that everybody could participate and contribute to that, uh, to, to improve that system. So um, just to, to finalize then, uh, Simon, I know that you have uh, some concrete and practical ideas and, and recommendations that uh, will contribute to this. Uh, would be also curious about uh, your comments from, you know, the, the entrepreneur here and this uh, tension that was mentioned, you know, how, how do we resolve the tension between these creative and innovative entrepreneurs and the conservative judge? Well, I think I'm uh, the one on the panel who has not studied law. I'm an engineer by education and uh, a business person by profession. So I have followed uh, the line of thought of the Deputy Prime Minister very carefully. I'm afraid I cannot offer uh, anything valuable there on uh, the principle of uh, delivering uh, in the judicial system. 
However, as an engineer, I can offer maybe some practical uh, solution to the whole, uh, to the whole point. Uh, now, on a second thought, uh, in order to do business in Greece, one has to understand law, and uh, especially the legal system in Greece. Now, having said that, um, you know, th there are some reforms that have been introduced uh, in, in the judicial system uh, in the past, like uh, the electronic submission of the required documents. Still, though, a complete file today, a fully prepared file, might take up to three years to be brought to trial. So this, this is something that we should take into account. I have offered some, uh, some idea about some metrics uh, before, you know, we have the number of days that it takes uh, for uh, uh, a case to be resolved, uh, all that. But for example, uh, how many judges do we have today in, in the Greek judiciary per category? And uh, how many cases are they called uh, to judge per day? You have mentioned that, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. There. But if the number of judges is adequate, and to my knowledge, because I searched a little bit, it appears to be higher than the European median, then perhaps we should take some actions to reduce the number of cases that appear before the courts. And uh, Mr. Stava mentioned that uh, before. It's, uh, it's, it's a very practical and quick solution there. Uh, it's very um, inexpensive today to bring cases uh, to trial and appear before court. We have to establish somehow a penalty when unjustified cases are brought to court and are finally dismissed. And maybe a system that we can develop there. Also, perhaps increase the fees so that it becomes more expensive to bring uh, unnecessary trials to the court. And uh, the other thing uh, that I would like to introduce here is the transparency, because this is one of the most important issues uh, in the business community today. Uh, today, the judges are, uh, you know, uh, the cabinet selects the judges and uh, appoints the presidents and vice presidents of the two Supreme uh, Courts among three candidates provided by the Ministry of Justice and the Parliamentary Committee. There. Perhaps we should change that so that uh, the judges are more independent, the higher courts are more independent, and uh, transparency and more credibility is introduced to the system. Uh, there. Now, the one other thing that uh, is crucial for uh, the development of the country and uh, the absorption of the RRF funds is uh, the number of uh, the public procurements that are necessary to absorb the funds. Uh, this, uh, we have to find some quick way to resolve all the issues that will arrive in, in, in the courts. So perhaps the establishment of the special branch of the Administrative Court of Appeals might be necessary, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, to, to resolve, uh, to, to expedite justice and to be able to absorb the funds. Okay. <coughs> Shall I answer? No. Yes, feel, free, feel free to, if you want a, a final comment. <laughs> not of course, we don't want to answer each of the questions, no, but if... Uh, I'm sure it's not it's going to okay, be an engineer. But, uh, <laughs> uh, the cost uh, is a big problem here in Greece, to increase the cost of uh, justice. I'll continue in Greek. Uh, Υπάρχει μεγάλη αντίδραση. <coughs> Υπάρχει μεγάλη αντίδραση από τα ελληνικά δικαστήρια για την αύξηση του κόστου της δίκης. Αντίδραση η οποία είναι δικαιολογημένη εμπολής διότι οφείλεται σε ιστορικούς λόγους. Ε, οφείλεται στα πρώτα ελληνικά συντάγματα τα οποία ήταν συντάγματα νεοτεριστικά και της φιλελεύθερης εποχής, τα οποία προέβλεπαν ότι η προσφυγή στη δικαιοσύνη είναι για όλους τους Έλληνες και ήδη και το Ελληνικό Σύνταγμα προβλέπει ότι έκαστος των Ελλήνων μπορεί να προσφύγει στη δικαιοσύνη. Το θέμα το αντιμετωπίσαμε την εποχή των μνημονίων, όπου μας επεβλήθη μεταξύ άλλων των μέτρων από τους λεγόμενους σήμερα θεσμούς ε, η αύξηση του κόστου ορισμένων ε, δικών και η αύξηση τη προσφυγή στη δικαιοσύνη. Εκεί λοιπόν υπήρξε τεράστια αντίδραση από τους ολομέλειους των δικαστηρίων 
οι οποίες αρνήθηκαν να προχωρήσουν σε τέτοιου είδους μέτρα και μπορέσαμε να αυξήσουμε το κόστος της δίκης σε πολύ ειδικέ περιπτώσεις όπως είναι τα ασφαλιστικά μέτρα που έχουν να κάνουν με επιχειρήσεις και σε τέτοια πράγματα. Λοιπόν, έχουμε να αντιμετωπίσουμε και, και ιστορικά φαινόμενα τα οποία τα βρίσκουμε ενώπιόν μας και πρέπει σιγά-σιγά να μπορέσουμε να τα ξεπεράσουμε και να φέρουμε πάλι τη δικαιοσύνη στη σύγχρονη εποχή. Τώρα, ο σκοπός της κυβέρνησης δεν είναι εύκολος. Ο σκοπός της κυβέρνησης είναι να προχωρήσουμε μέσα, μέσω της Εθνικής Σχολής Δικαστικών Λειτουργών ε, να προχωρήσουμε στη δημιουργία μιας νέας γενιάς δικαστικών λειτουργών. Και προσπαθούμε με παραδείγματα έτσι να, να εμπνεύσουμε τη νέα γενιά, μια νέα γενιά η οποία θα είναι προσαρμοσμένη στις εξελίξεις κοινωνίας, στην τεχνολογία, ε, θα έχει διαβάσει πιο πολύ, θα αντιλαμβάνει τον κόσμο, θα ξέρει γλώσσες, θα επικοινωνεί πιο εύκολα με τις όλες χώρες και εγώ... Πιστεύω ότι η Ευρώπη και τα όργανα της Ευρώπης ε, μπορούν, της Ευρωπαϊκής Κοινότητας εννοώ, ότι μπορούν να βοηθήσουν πάρα πολύ σε αυτό το τομέα, διότι η τελική κατάληξη πρέπει να είναι ότι εφόσον θα εξακολουθήσει να υπάρχει η Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση, να ενοποιηθεί όλο το δίκαιο, you are smiling, της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης. Υπάρχουν τομεί όπου ήδη έχουν γίνει πολλά βήματα. Είναι εύκολο να ενοποιηθεί το δίκαιο, διότι όλες οι ευρωπαϊκές χώρες ακολουθούν το λατινικό σύστημα. Έχουμε δηλαδή πολιτικά δικαστήρια και δικαιητικά δικαστήρια. Έχουμε κοινού κανόνες. Έχουμε κοινά συντάγματα, γενικές αρχές του δικαίου, τις οποίες εφαρμόζει το ευρωπαϊκό δίκαιο. Λοιπόν, ας πάμε γρήγορα, ειλικρινά το λέω, ας πάμε γρήγορα σε μία ενοποίηση σε τομείς όπως το οικογενειακό δίκαιο, το εμπορικό δίκαιο, όλα αυτά. Υπάρχει και ανάγκη να ενοποιηθούν, διότι όλα αυτά ασκούν και τεράστια επιρροή στην οικονομία των χωρών, η ενοποίηση του εμπορικού δικαίου ή το φορολογικού δικαίου ασκεί τεράστια επιρροή στην οικονομική εξέλιξη. Δεν μιλάω άλλο γιατί παραμύχει. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, of course it's very difficult to exhaust this this conversation, but we are running out of time. So um, just uh, let me thank uh, our panelists and the keynote uh, speaker uh, on this one. I hope uh, that. Uh, This debate has contributed to this important uh, process. The World Bank is uh, starting to partner with the government in this uh, agenda, and we are hoping that we will be present uh, more uh, frequently here with all of you and uh, re ready to provide all the support that is necessary. So thank you again uh, to the panelists and for the recommendations, and I hope that was helpful to the government as well. Thanks.